Hello, Microbial Nation, and welcome to another episode of The Micro Moment. We're here talking about astromicrobiology, and today we're joined with Dr. Jen Blanc. She got her master's in geology from Stanford University, her master's in science and oceanography from University of Washington. She also studied geochemistry and getting a PhD from Caltech. She's an astrobiologist at the NASA Ames Research Center and research scientist at the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. Thank you very much and welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. So let's start off. Uh, can you tell us a little about yourself? Okay, well, to add to your introduction, I guess I'm a third generation geologist. So I sort of, oh, really? Oh, yeah, I sort of grew up thinking that science was a way of life. And in my case, my dad was a geophysicist, but he, he liked going in the field. So I grew up doing a lot of camping with the family and always making measurements. And when I was a teenager, my family lived in Saudi Arabia. So that was sort of transformative for me because we spent a lot of weekends going out in the desert with no roads and looking at you know, barren you know, features. And that was sort of interesting. It was like a planetary landscape in our backyard. How'd that compare to the deserts in California? Gosh, well, deserts in California are pretty different depending on where you are. But I would say that, that's a really good question. No, no one's ever asked me that. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, it just, it just seemed more vast, right? The deserts in California, you can always sort of drive and get somewhere. Whereas there, you'd go out and you just have maps and there'd be no roads. And you're like, where are we going to go this weekend? Let's look on the, the photo mosaic map and pick a spot and go explore. And the funny thing was, no matter where we went, we'd park, park the Land Rovers and inevitably, a better one would come and find us. <laughs> it wasn't as barren as we thought. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, it was just, it, it was so interesting because we're, we're on um, terrain that had, you know, people from biblical times, camel tra trains, uh, archaeological treasures, and but it was all open, not protected, and a really interesting time to be exploring there. Is, is that the, your most memorable, like, area for, like, camping? Well, probably. We would camp in the desert, and just flat, usually, and so... You know, you'd go out to go to the bathroom and then turn off your flashlight. <laughs> that, that, that was the nature's bathroom. But um, I like to sleep on top of the Land Rover because uh, we didn't know what would crawl, try to crawl in the sleeping bag, like scorpions and other strange beetles. So we always slept on cots or, in my case, on the top of the Land Rover <laughs> <laughs> where I felt extra safe. But yeah, it's, it was um, always hot and we didn't have showers. And so it was a little uncomfortable, but there was always something interesting to see. I'm sure that the the night sky must have been amazing there. Yeah, it, it certainly was. I mean, the only place I've seen that can compare to that is the night sky in, in the South Island of New Zealand. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. right there. And, and I know there are dark sky preserves in the U.S. And I mm -hmm. haven't visited and they're, well, they're all around the world now. But uh, it's such a difference. I can look up. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area in a city called Livermore. And um, we have vineyards behind our house. So at nighttime, I can see the Milky Way on clear nights, but it's just very, very fuzzy. And that's different from having this you know, giant feature pop out of you. It's pretty cool. <laughs> that's really cool. So in your definition, what is astromicrobiology or astrobiology? Yeah, that's a really good question. What is astrobiology? Because I think uh, if you ask 10 different people, you'd get 10 different answers. <laughs> So I like to say it's anything you want to be, but I think of it really as um, a study of multiple disciplines that try to connect via a common theme of what processes might lead to the building blocks of life or the evolution of life, the origin of life, and uh, or you know, the building blocks I mentioned. So it could be, you know, how can you make carbon from stars? That could be a part of astrobiology. But really it's anything having to do with the origin of life, the search for life, and the, the process or the evolutionary uh, traits and characteristics of life. And that could be anything from looking for organic molecules, water, or even looking uh, within our own planet to see if they're like models, right? Right. So a lot of the work I do these days is actually looking for extreme environments on life. By extreme, I mean places that have I don't know, high temperature or cold temperature or weird chemistry and the study the microbes that live there and how they, you know, trying to understand now that we have, you know, more sophisticated tools, trying to understand how those microbes are managing to survive and thrive 
in what we consider extreme environments. And that's sort of like a proxy or an analog for areas we might think of that could be on other planets or might have been, for example, on Mars in this ancient past. So I know that your background is in geochemistry. How did you end up working with bacteria or microbes, I should say? Yeah, so full disclosure here, I do sample from my microbiology friends, and I do um, talk with them and discuss things, but I really work collaboratively with microbiologists rather than you know, call myself a microbiologist myself. I like to think that I try to characterize the food, <laughs> like the food and the nutrition for microorganisms living in these extreme environments, or characterize an environment and assess the habitability or the, you know, the available energy resources that could support microbial life. And so one another thing about astrobiology is it's very interdisciplinary. So it's rare that you find someone doing only one thing who will call him or herself an astrobiologist. Usually we're working in teams and, and, and partnering to you know, understand a, an area, or understand a process uh, collectively. I can imagine, yeah, that there's some interesting things that you find for the microbes to eat because for humans, you know, we think what we think sugar, fat, protein, but microbes can sometimes make their own energy depending on the species. And they can use some compounds that we wouldn't even think of uh, using, I think, what, like maybe iron or some other elements like that. Right. So there, uh, for example, some years ago, there was a quite a controversial study that looked at um, microbes that were using arsenic in their metabolism. And so they had you know, arsenic in, in um, essentially they, they, they uh, consumed um, materials from a toxic lake and then had arsenic in their um, proteins that were in their systems. So that's interesting as a substitution um, for wow. phosphorus. It's sort of interesting. And, but we do, we do study that. And, and in, I like, so coming from geochemistry, I study the fluids, so the waters that interact with rocks and um, altered rocks. And so they pick up mineral chemistry that's carried by the water. So then this mineral chemistry can in turn um, have, uh, as it breaks down, have re oxidation reduction reactions. And it's that redox energy that can help microbes thrive. So it's a sort of a chemosynthetic energy source. So I also mentioned that you work with NASA. Uh, was NASA an organization you always wanted to be a part of? or uh, And what was the process? to be involved with NASA? Well, I think there there can be many roads to NASA, and I have not taken the most strategic one. <laughs> so in other words, I have had a lot of different, uh, I took a lot of different uh, turns on the way to becoming a NASA scientist. And even today, I'm not a civil servant. I am a, what we call a NASA contractor. So I work for a small company called Blue Marble Space, and, and yet I have a, an, an office and a lab at one of the NASA research centers, so NASA Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley. I think the more conventional way is to become an intern at NASA when you're any, anywhere from high school to college or further, and then come back as a paid intern, <laughs> and then or come back as a visitor or a postdoc or a researcher, and then march along that pathway. Um, I came in with my own grant money and uh, talk them into giving me space, <laughs> hmm. uh, which is, it's just been nice. I mean, it's nice that they were welcoming and um, I have many colleagues at NASA Ames I work with. So that's good. Was there a specific project or uh, something that they were working on that really piqued your interest at the time? Um, well, I did work on the Mars Science Laboratory, the Curiosity Rover project for about 10 years before it got to Mars. And then for some years afterwards, I so in that case, um, I worked with a particular instrument team. I worked with the first interplanetary laser. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. <laughs> and Curiosity, Curiosity did not have a light detection instrument on it, but it had this cool instrument called the LIBS, or Laser Ionization Breakdown Spectrometry. And essentially, you fire a laser at the target. In this case, the target can be up to seven meters away from the robot. And you fire it at the target, and it creates a tiny little plasma. And then as that plasma of energy cools down, it emits light, and the detector um, on the instrument can identify the elements that correspond to the different energy levels of that light. And so coming as a, someone who studies geochemistry and mineralogy to someone who's looking at these just elemental paths, it's sort of like looking you know, at metage metagenomic data. It's a lot of data analysis. It really is. <laughs> it's it's a, a multivariate analysis to try to tease out possible mineralogy patterns that can that can relate to those plasma 
the plasma data. But it was it was still very interesting to see how quickly we can we can generate gazillion, well, maybe not gazillion, but you know, 800,000 <laughs> laser shots um, with data from the Martian surface. And that was really cool. You know, we didn't know, well, we, we had ideas from the laboratory work, but we didn't know how the lasers would work in a very low uh, CO2 dominant atmosphere on Mars. And it's, you know, it's worked better than we ever imagined. In fact, um, the next iteration of this planetary laser is on perseverance in the form of supercam. So it's bigger and better. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. I, I, for some reason, I never pictured that on the Curiosity rover. I do read a little bit every now and then. Is that kind of using the the light that's emitted? Is that kind of similar of looking at distant planets and using the light to try to see what kind of elements are found on that planet? Well, it's it's the the detection part is similar, right? Yeah. Look, use telescopes to look at distant planets. We're collecting the light or the energy. Mm-hmm. Um, in that small pathway that goes from here, us on Earth or us, you know, in Hubble in space to our target, right, or our tiny little little spot in the sky. But in terms of you know, there, we're we're observing passively, right? For so for the Hubble or for the James Webb, we're observing the light that comes in. Whereas with the ChemCam, the LIBS instrument, we actually blast something <laughs> right and then we observe it so we're kind of you know a little bit aggressive it's just that in the case of the cam cam laser and super cam we use a very special low energy and uh, energy that i'm uh, sorry a laser that will operate at very low energies and at low um, temperatures uh, that correspond to the martian surface so now your work involves some extreme environments such as volcanic caves and uh environments that are similar to mars uh what do you study in these environments? I mean, I know that you had mentioned uh, studying the water and the mineral composition as it flows in that environment or through that environment. We can argue that a lot of different environments might have been similar to a Martian environment. We think that Mars had flowing water on the surface based on you know what we see from observing the big cross sections of bedding and water features, ripples. Um, in, in you know in, in the deposits and, and evidence like like right now we're perseverances we think it was an ancient river delta. Uh, one of these environments that we're using as analog are lava caves or lava tubes, and we, from orbit you know we're, we have we have I think seven different orbiters happening or studying Mars right now. The six of the Indian Space Agency's mom um, orbiter I think is just turned off. But anyway, um, so we have a lot of imagery of the surface of Mars, and we see skylights. We see indications from orbit of things that look like lava flows. We know from orbit and from our our landers and robots that the composition of much of Mars is volcanic, mostly volcanic. And um, so, anyway, so we think I say we, you know I, these are called candidate cave entrances because we won't know until we go there. But there seem to be hundreds of these, in fact, more than a thousand of these candidate cave entrances on, on Mars. And there are, we do see volcanoes on Mars. So what if, you know, we haven't, so far we haven't seen evidence of life on the surface of Mars um, active today, but what if um, evidence of life could exist in the subsurface, so underneath the surface, or uh, mineral evidence that life was there once could be preserved in the subsurface? And how do we get there? Well, we can drill. <laughs> and so far, we've drilled, I think, about a meter or so. And that's not very deep. Or we could go into a lava cave. And the lava caves on Mars, because the gravity of Mars is, is, is um, smaller. And I'm sorry, it's, you know, Mars is smaller, so the gravity is smaller. We weigh less on Mars. But that means when a lava is flowing, the lava tube would be much bigger. And that's borne out by our indications of, you know, lava tubes or lava lava flows on the surface that are much bigger and much longer than Earth. So the thought is, hey, if this is a cave, maybe it's a much bigger environment. Uh, and also, you know, it, it could preserve if there is a, if there is if microbial life exists in the cave and it leaves behind a signature. I personally don't think we're gonna find life in caves today on Mars, but I think that we might find life if it was there. Um, that has left behind a chemical or mineralogical signature. And that led us to look at lava tubes on Earth. And we see a lot of people, if they've been to caves on Earth or lava caves, um, they might go in and say, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it looks pretty normal. It's flowing with gravity. It's a tube. Okay. But if you start staring at the wall, <laughs> you start to see all sorts of interesting features, right? It's really, it's really cool. The more you look, the more you see. 
And in some cases, they're soft features of biofilms that coat the walls. And they might be white or yellow, or some you know, they're yellow, but we might call them golden because they look like gold <laughs> to me. And they're actually the surface um, is a hydrophobic surface, so they'll the water will beat up on them. So I like to say it looks like golden biofilm with little sparkly diamonds, which is really like yellow, yellow biofilm with water. But the first part, the first way sounds so much more romantic. <laughs> um, but anyway, and we see mineral features that look like, you know, something like this. It's just a little bumpy, little tiny. These are, you know, less than a millimeter. So they're pretty small. But in some cases, they get up to a couple couple centimeters of what look to be sort of like cave corals. So they resemble ocean corals, except instead of being carbonate, they're mostly silica. And I think that's because the lava, the, the lava tube is mostly silica. But the thing that's cool about that is and this is why we talk NASA and you know supporting our work is that if these features are silica rather than carbonate, they have a better chance of being preserved and not weathering away. Carbonate tends to dissolve more readily, whereas the silica features will stay around. So I'm like, wow, what if we could go into a cave on Mars and we found some weird bumps that didn't look like you know they were just basic lava, right? right. Everything else, they, I mean, this could be a sign or a symbol. You know, of, of uh, indication of ancient life that can persist for for eons. So, um, for that reason, and because I think um, if I were going to go to Mars, I want to go to a cave because Mars doesn't have a strong magnetosphere because the, we think Mars is mostly uh, solid, and so it's not protected from the solar wind and the ionizing radiation. So, personally, I'd want to go underground to be protected by you know several meters of rock. <laughs> so, there's that kind of dual interest. I was actually going to uh, bring that up because my understanding is Mars doesn't really have much of an atmosphere. It has maybe little pockets of uh, that magnetic shielding that the Earth has, but they're just little pockets. So you're being bombarded by solar radiation all the time there. Yeah, I, you know, the same is true on our moon. I actually, um, until recently, I thought the moon was mostly protected from Earth's magnetosphere. But then I saw a model and measurements of like a, the earth, you know, the, the solar wind, just imagine a wind blowing harder than we can imagine. And then our, our magnetosphere buffering against it and protecting us. But then it goes around the magnetosphere and then there's like a tail and the tail is wiggling. So sometimes the moon's protected and sometimes it's not. So, hey, there are caves on the moon too. Don't think there are microbes there, but I'd want to go to a cave on the moon too <laughs> and be protected. <laughs> so, um, um, you know, this, this project and this recent work in lava tubes is really made me a huge advocate for lava caves. And, and the caves on the moon will be even bigger than those on Mars. And in the case of the moon, we've actually imaged the big void spaces where the Japanese have, the Japanese space agency, using a gra gravity, um, a ground penetrating uh, radar um, measurements from space. So that's pretty exciting. So the, the lava tubes on the moon, is that because it's even smaller than Mars? So essentially when they're flowing, the, the lava, is, it's a, you know, gases are inside the lava and they're expanding to escape and it just pushes the lava into bigger volume. So uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty cool. <laughs> That's kind of getting away from microbiology. But um, <laughs> so, <laughs> is, so in terms of in terms of Mars, right, we sent we sent the Viking landers to Mars in the 70s. And they had these, I mean, just, I can't, it's really cool to go back and imagine how primitive these, these computers and systems were, and yet we did so much. But the experiments on board, the, there, were, there were light detection instrumentation, uh, instruments on the two landers, and they, they sort of gave a teasing result. You know, partly was the experiment wasn't designed to give a yes-no result. It kind of gave it an you know, ambiguous result. And so then... Since then, NASA has been more conservative. So now we've talked about following the water, looking for water, or in the case of uh, Curiosity, or the Mars Science Laboratory, looking for habitability. Is there evidence of water or waters that can have been associated with minerals that we're measuring? And even Perseverance, it has um, it has spectrometers in the form of Sherlock, and it has Raman that can detect organic compounds on SuperCam, but it doesn't have you know the the box that's going to say is this life, and if it is. Let's sequence it. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there are really creative uh, instruments that have been proposed for future missions to Mars. So, for example, Craig Venner has created a, an assembly where they can measure a sample and then it will actually do a mirror sequencing back, you know, in the lab somewhere else. So, oh, really? Yeah, something really 
um, I don't understand it totally, but it sounds amazing. And I know he's worked with some of my colleagues at NASA Ames testing in, in places of, of low biomass, like the um, Death Valley, for example. So you also said, like, looking at traces of life in these tubes. So if I remember correctly, like, they're, they're fossils of microbes, or at least we believe there are. They're about, like, 3.5 billion years old. Is that something similar that you'd be looking f- for? Yeah, that, that's actually a really great question because we don't know the exact age, ages of the volcanic tubes on Mars, but they would probably be very old. And we think if we look at the, you know, assuming that Mars uh, became a planet about the same time as Earth, right? So about, was it, 4.5 billion years ago, around there, you know, based on actually lead, lead data of samples from the moon. Um, so radioactive decay uh, models, then we think that the water left the surface of, of Mars, you know, in the first uh, half a billion to billion years. So by, you know, by 3.5, 3.8 billion years, about the time we had the first life on Earth, Mars was all dried up. Really? Yeah. So it's really, it's like this, I mean, I wonder in our lifetime, we'll figure this out because there are people who think that life on Earth came from Mars. <sighs> It's panspermia, panspermia theory? Yeah. And in fact, there are people who have done modeling, you know, like orbital dynamics and show that, hey, if we had a meteor or an asteroid hit Mars at a certain angle, it could eject material that could then, you know, out over some time make its way to Earth. And other investigators have shown that in that impact delivery to Earth, if the microbes are sort of inside, inside the rock as opposed to on the surface, they could be preserved, they could survive. So it's it's pretty wild. <laughs> I you know I don't know if we'll know, right? I mean, how we'll, how we'll know, but but in terms of going back to um, evidence of microbial life on Earth, yeah, you're right, absolutely right. Like 2.5 or so, and this is from rocks both in um, South Africa and in Australia. So you know, two continents where we can put them back together using you know, the reverse tectonics. <laughs> um, so similar aged rocks, and these these are not like fossils at all. This is a time before fossils. We have evidence in the form of stromatolites. So stromatolites that we see in Baja, California, or these actually in places in Australia today, in Western Australia, these big mounds of mostly carbonate, carbonate mounds are interpolated with sand and some other mineralogy and layers of organics that sort of um, are preserved in the rock record. And then when you see them, they look sort of like undulatory, rounded features rather than more um, sort of obviously uh, inorganic mineral features. And then the investigators have used stable isotopes like carbon isotopes and phosphorus isotopes also to show that their chemistry has a signature of life as well. So how does studying the microbes found in these extreme environments on Earth infer possible life on other planets or planetary bodies? I mean, you already got you already went to little depth of there. Yeah. Well, so for example, you know, I talk about lava tubes, and actually, lava tubes aren't that extreme. They're extreme in the sense that there's no light, right? But right. their pH and the chemistry is pretty common. Another place I've been studying is well, a couple of places, but just last weekend, I went up to a spring near Mount Shasta, California, and this spring is called the Nay Spring, and it's it's a really high pH, over twelve pH of over twelve, so super oxidizing. You know, we. Uh, anyway, and it's it used to be um, so right right to these days it's a it's a cistern next to a little creek in Forest Service land, and the cistern has this this really high pH and bubbling through the spring is methane gas, so it has the highest percentage of gas that's methane from any sort of spring effluent on any continent in the world that we know of, and you know how can life live there? If we touch it, it feels oily. It's really gross. It kind of burns your skin a little bit. There are people who come to Mount Shasta as pilgrims to um, because some people believe that there are space aliens who live in the in Mount Shasta, and mm. it's like a you know way to commune with them a little bit. I think I I don't want to misrepresent them, but it's a little foreign to me. <laughs> so there are people who we've met who actually bathe in the spring, which you know we're like, oh, that's not really what we want because we but we've never found any indication of human microbe. The human microbiome in the spring, probably the other <laughs> way. <laughs> but they, you know, they get in the spring to cleanse them. I mean, the people get in the spring to cleanse themselves. And we're like, oh my gosh! But a hundred plus years ago, a person owned the land, and he saw that the spring was really weird, and actually had some chemical analyses done, and even um, 
essentially branded the site as a place of great health and wellness and made a little spa there. So people would come from far around and buy the tonic to put make them have curly hair or drink the tonic. With, this sounds horrifying. Drink it to help cure stomach ailments. I think it probably made them worse. But anyway, there's a there's a local museum that has documented all this. It's really cool. <laughs> But we are studying, I mean, so I'm, I'm essentially helping to characterize the geochemistry, but working with another team of microbiologists are trying to figure out, okay, if this microbe is thriving here, you know, first of all, let's do a, you know, like a regular 16S um, inventory of what does the community look like in terms of who can we find who's living here? And then also do, you know, a, a essentially a metagenomic assay to see, hey, what, which kinds of, you know, metabolic pathways we can detect in these organisms and what are, what are they, where are they getting their redox energy from? So is it from the site actually has a lot of silica, there's a lot of um, nitrogen. So are they, are they using, you know, are they reducing nitrogen to, to thrive? Are they using sulfur? And so we're trying to pin that down to better understand that. And in terms of how that might relate to elsewhere, well, you know, NASA's proposing to go to the icy, icy moons someday in the not too distant future. Although it'll take us a long time to get there. <laughs> well, um, you know, we see um, from the Cassini mission, we see evidence that there are plumes of vapor that are erupting from Europa and from Enceladus. So moons of Saturn and Jupiter. And um, does that mean there's life of hydrothermal life underneath the ice on the surface of these planets? It could be. In which case, what would the chemistry and the geochemistry of, that, of those fluids be that could support life? So would it be really oxidizing or really reducing? We know it would probably be very different from what we see on Earth. And so we're trying to get a sort of a frame, a framework for how we might interpret that one day. Yeah. Is it Europa that has that has water that they think is 10 like miles below the surface? Um, yeah. So there have been different models based on, you know, the essentially the the um, the gravity of Europa and the angle of momentum. And they model essentially the structure of Europa. So they think uh, I, I, might, I might be out of date in terms of um, the current depth of the ocean because they're all model dependent. But I've heard about thirteen to forty kilometers down. <laughs> so wow. that would take a you know a, a really interesting technology to design an instrument that will go just like the China syndrome, you know, melting a nuclear reactor or something going down <laughs> to um, penetrate all that ice um, down into the ocean oceans below and we we do think just you know mo people who modeled the angular momentum of the body and um just just the orbital behavior they think that uh, if you know if they assume certain densities like rock and then some kind of briny water and then ice what kind of density uh, uh whatever uh, profile would give us the same like rotation and and uh shape of the, of the moon we see today and so we do think it's not pure water it's it's something that's Briny, but is it briny like um, seawater, or is it briny like something much more noxious to us? <laughs> and, uh, and and the same is true that there are models for some of the other moons that have two oceans. It, it's really interesting. I, I have you seen pictures of of Titan? We have a, a NASA has a mission to go to Titan and have a little helicopter dragonfly that's going to move around. And this is the the moon of um, Saturn that has uh, hydrocarbons in the atmosphere. It's essentially it's a super thick haze, an atmospheric haze, and lakes of antifreeze on the surface. But um, you know, some of my colleagues have said, well, actually, we think that Titan has subterranean oceans too. You know, we had this idea of the Goldilocks zone for a long time. That That is that, you know, if we look at the distance of Earth from the sun, it's a place where there's liquid water. So if we go to Venus, it's too hot. If we go to Mars, it's too cold. But if we're on Earth, it's just right, so life can live. But you know, as we understand more and more about where water is, and you know, if we think if we think that life as we know it requires water, which is what we—that's our working belief. <laughs> Gosh, what about these subterranean oceans? You know, there are subsurface oceans on all of these planets. Many of them, some of all of these moons, many of them seem to have them. So that means either the Goldilocks zone is going to expand <laughs> and become much broader. Um, or we need to have a new term. And it's particularly exciting when you think about looking for exoplanets, so planets orbiting other stars beyond mm. the solar system. It's so cool. And now with the James Webb telescope and and the you know the, the planet hunter, the test that's going to be looking for exoplanets, we're just going to find more and more of these exoplanets that are in zones that that could support life as we know it. 
So it's it's a great time to be going into this, you know, any of this astrobiology field or um, just trying to understand. I, I really, well, I, you know, I don't know at all, but I really believe we're going to find life under us. And I think it's going to be my probate life. This week's episode of The Micro Moment is brought to you by Zymo Research. Validate your workflow with Zymo Biomics Gut Microbiome Standard, an accurately quantified microbial community mimicking the human gut microbiome. Zymo's complete microbiome solutions have optimized methods for sample collection, nucleic acid extraction, library prep, and bioinformatics. You can find out more by visiting their website, zymoresearch.com. I, uh, I like how you talked about the Goldilocks zone because uh, it feels like, yeah, our standard definition of what defines life is possibly, you know, moving further away. I feel like it's at least a little outdated. Um, on, Maybe because, <clears throat> oh, I mean, at least growing up, it was always like, it always has to be carbon-based. And it's like, does it have to be carbon-based? One of my favorite Star Trek episodes growing we've up. Seen it. We've all seen it. <laughs> yeah. You know, they had the crystalline creatures that were not carbon-based. Yeah. And, you know, they went through all the calculations, throughout all the definitions of life and what isn't the computer comes up with life. and. Yeah. But, you know, Star Trek also had those episodes where the life was just an energy form. Right. Right. So maybe we'll find that kind of life. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I want just to find something else, right? I want to, I guess, yeah, I just want to find more. <laughs> right. As long as they're friendly. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it would be microbial. I feel like, at least in some harsher environments, at least microbes seem to fare better than multicellular organisms and also was that there's also the possibility that instead of carbon there's silica based life sure. mm -hmm. as well uh, i mean um there are i mean again i'm going back to star trek for that one <laughs> there are people i'm thinking of steve benner from the university of florida there are people who make artificial amino acids so combinations of that uh, you know peptide bond are going to make little peptides that are um essentially not anything we find in nature, right? So we know that we have 20, 20 amino acids that make up just about all life or they're sort of essential amino acids. And actually essential means that, <laughs> essential means that we have to eat them, right? As opposed to right. them ourselves. And so they've, you know, in the laboratory and so organic synthesis chemists have made different types of um, amino acids and peptides. And it's interesting to see, you know, so occasionally you find in microbial life Again, different functional groups that we wouldn't expect, and I think in some, you know, those usually reflect the environment in which they've they've adapted. So, we, so we learn about that too by studying extreme environments on Earth. You know, like, hey, this this organism can live in ice because it secretes antifreeze around the outside of its uh, you know membrane, and that allows it to live in a place that is frozen. So that's an example, right? Um, or likewise, are there, there are microbes that live in hypothermal hot springs, and they're somehow able to, you know, only use proteins that don't denature at the higher temperatures. So, you know, we're just trying to understand what what the chemistry is there, and what is it about the chemistry that helps them stay together and helps them uh, not not explode or melt <laughs> they, <laughs> when they go away, <laughs> degenerate. I don't know. <laughs> So I want to uh, pivot a little bit because uh, I read that you also either you use or you have used robots in these environments. What's it like using robots, and why are, why are we using them? Well, probably our okay. First thing is why do we use them? Because um, when we, although it's it is really fun to send people or such fun, it's very inspiring to have astronauts go places. We send the robots first, right? And so, um, because it's, uh, it's there's less risk involved, and because it's 
so, 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 so much less expensive. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, as we as we branch out further into the solar system, I think we'll keep leading with that you know, first the orbiter and then the lander or the robot. So that's why we're practicing with robots. In terms of what it's like to work with them, we in the lava tubes, so we've been working at a fuel site in Northern California that has, um, gosh, over 800 known lava tubes that have been mapped. So it's just, or at least identified and looked, you know, or explored a little bit. And um, we picked one cave in particular, or two caves in particular that actually are easy to get into. Not all, not all the caves are. So we sort of biased our approach that way. And then we've used wheeled robots, which were okay, and that those correspond to the kinds of robots we've sent to the moon and to Mars. But then more recently, we've started working with these um, Boston Dynamics walking robots. And I gotta say, they are the coolest things. <laughs> they are not like the TV or the movie robots, though, because they do creak and make noises. Um, they do fall over awkwardly, rarely, but they do. And then they can get up. It's kind of cool. But it's not as cool as, say, the Terminator. <laughs> or something <laughs> you might see in robots where it's a nice puppy, right? And the, I've been working with a team from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL. And um, they uh, competed in a, a DARPA challenge recently. Or, you know, essentially they were competing while they were working together. And it's just, that's just wrapped. And in that DARPA challenge, it was all about how to navigate in the subsurface. So in, in human, you know, in mines and tunnels and how they, they couch things in terms of how to find artifacts that would relate to search and rescue. So whether it was a dummy or a helmet or a rope, or something like this. And so we took all of that technology development that the team, the JPL team had done or, or had, had um, generated to compete, you know, really effectively in the Starter Challenge. And then said, well, what about this really cool technology for autonomy, right? When you're, can we apply it to a, an extreme environment or a, or a rather analog environment and can we use these robots to detect life so we you know that's what we've been doing is taking the robots in the caves and and they they work collaboratively so we'll have multiple robots walking together and and they actually can these, these spot robots will squat and like eject a little radio transponder <laughs> that normal network and then they can keep going further and further out of line of sight generating a LIDAR map, a sort of 3D LIDAR map, and always sending it back to a base station that's, you know, can be at the surface of the cave or outside somewhere. Uh, it's all about, you know, how much uh, how much energy you want to put into the radio communication strength of you know, the network. And then also, we, we, you know, in this case, we've also taken a lot of images with robots and with our human astrobiologists taking pictures of the features we want them to find on the caves. So we take these pictures, we... Um, our um, robot software guys, you know, gurus, they've developed AI or machine learning algorithms um, for it's. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty standard tool now, which is so cool. It's like they're essentially an algorithm for image based on image classification. Is it a biofilm? Is it not? You know, if we see it, is it yes or no? So it's pretty, I mean, what we've been doing is kind of basic, but it's in the dark. So we have pretty poor quality imaging, right? And um, they're succeeding pretty well. And I can see this going in a direction where, you know, you have a uh, fusion of imagery with, say, data, you know, chem like chemistry from the chem cam, the laser, you know, standoff, so that the robot doesn't have to go to the wall, but could just be several meters away and say, what do I see? Let's do a raster and let's look every six, you know, six inches or something. And do we see something interesting? Yes, no. We'll go forward and explore, you know, or turn on the light and take a picture that people you know, our, our the limited humans that operate us <laughs> can see. <laughs> no, but it's like, so, you know, we're only taking baby steps toward that direction, but I think um, that that's where we're going, right? More and more autonomy. But again, it might be autonomy where right now that like the JPL folks have been training and, and others too, but I, I know about their work best because I work with them. They've been training to be able to traverse difficult terrain and, you know, make this, have a robot make decisions by itself as to, hey, should I go this way? that's steep or this way that has a rubble pile. So I have to, you know, they have algorithms so that robots have to assess the risk and then make a decision, right? Um, so that's one thing is, is, the, is the traveling. And the other thing is we, we can train them to look for targets of interest to us. But there might be other targets we don't even know are really cool. So it could be that they could be sending back images or information, spectral data, other chemical data. And then the scientists will have to go really fast and say, oh, I'm changing my algorithm. Forget what I said before. Look for this one. <laughs> you know, so we're still, you know, having this uh, human potential for human robot partnerships. And likewise, we have a, a couple of people on our team who've been developing uh, virtual reality experiences. 
So when the robot's sending in real time the, the map of the cave, you can put on a Quest headset and you know be following in the path of the robot, or if you need to, say stop. <laughs> you know, and and um, you know we're again just making baby steps in in I think toward what will be future missions and future capabilities. So it's pretty exciting. I didn't realize we're using those robots to go into to those caves. That's really cool. Are they the ones that have four legs that are going down yeah. there? Yeah. In fact, if you're interested, Boston Dynamics um, came out with us one time in the field last year and sent some videographers. If you go to YouTube and search for Boston Dynamics and then search for life, it shows um, sort of an aspirational view of what we were trying to do. Because in the, in the case for the movie, I have to confess, um, we had human operators operating the robots. And including an amazing technician from Boston Dynamics who was really skilled and maneuvered the arm and uh, was really good. And so we're trying to do these things without human intervention. <laughs> do you think, kind of as a side note, one of those robots, say, from like Boston Dynamics could be used for further or later Mars missions? Or is it too fragile? You know, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I really believe so. I really believe so. I think when I, walk, when I watch them versus the real robots, they're faster, they're more agile, they weigh a lot less. And um, so I, I think because they can self, self-write, you know, you know self-recover, I, I want them to go. However, you know, they're not ready for space. So all, like all the things we talked about at the beginning in terms of protection from radiation, or in this case, battery life, right? Most of the world mm-hmm. and recently have some sort of radioactive power source. And these guys have batteries, lives that last, and the batteries that last 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, hmm, you need to, you know, or how do they, how do they, how do the electronics function like the temperatures on the moon or on Mars to go from minus 160 up to 20 or something? Or in, in the case of the moon, even, I think hot, really hot to really cold. How can we make electronics? So th- these are, these are technology challenges for those guys. <laughs> but, um, but you know, it's so cool. So like in the YouTube video, the Boston Dynamics uh, technician actually was able to manipulate the arm to take an ATP swap. Have you seen those? So people, in, in the, especially in the food industry, they use um, a little swab and then they put it in an aluminometer and the cipherase, right? It puts, it puts in a reagent and if there's a cipherase, um, it'll light up. And from that, they ha- it's essentially a rough proxy for how much biology or how much microbial biomass is present. Oh. So, um, so we had that, you know, the robots doing on the side of the cave. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I mean, wouldn't that be cool in the future having having just a very routine thing to um, just swab and, and check because it's a very easy measurement to make um, for a human to make. It's a little right. challenging for it. You know, it's a little more requires a little finesse for the robot. Um, but I can certainly see that being, you know, something under development. Like again, we need we need a yes or no instrument for life detection. Right. Really cool. <laughs> so this is a side note. Um, I also read that you made mini volcanoes in the lab. <laughs> how did you do this and how cool was it to use the volcano? Okay, so yeah, that's pretty funny. So I did my thesis studying volatiles. So, you know, again, volatiles are energy for life, but before I sort of teamed up the microbiologists and the robotics guys, I was uh, started out by doing experiments in the lab. And they were to see how, you know, how do volcanoes do gas, how much gas could come out of a volcano, or how much gas could be held in a magma chamber. Um, and so to do that, I took, uh, you know, essentially rocks the size of my pinky and put them in a, a, an assembly that I had, then I pressurized and heated, and then let the gas diffuse in. And then after waiting for months for that to happen, <laughs> and then I, <laughs> I cooled, quenched everything, you know, quenched it like glass, it's glass. And then I, took it to the you know, lab and figure out how to figure out how much carbon or water I'd, I'd pushed in the rock. So it was a very weird kind of experiment. Like, okay, start out with a dry rock, push water and carbon dioxide in it and figure out how much went in. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, I think these, the numbers I, you know, the, the, the results I have will probably stand for you know many, many generations, but it was really like a material science uh, experiment. And I have to say that I came into doing this work, which is under the umbrella of experimental petrology, not really having experience working with tools. And all of a sudden I was working with pipes, plumbing, coning and threading, working with high pressures, and then working with vacuums to get the get the volatiles out. So I, I never thought going to grad school would uh, give me the opportunity to learn how to blow glass, for example, or learn how to plumb things and and solder. <laughs> and <laughs> All these tools that I don't use at the moment, <laughs> but um, 
you know, it, it was an, it was a it was either hell or it was a great opportunity. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I, I choose to think of it as a great opportunity, and and I actually had some great you know tutors and mentors along the way, so that was good. Well, those are some great skills to pick up. I mean, <laughs> I, I took a, a glass blowing class. Oh, and cool! That was that was a really cool one time, and yeah. I wish I was actually like. I could do stuff like plumbing. I am terrible at household projects. <laughs> now, what I've decided about household projects or, or you know, whatever DIY fixing things is that you can't hesitate. You know, you just have to assume it's going to break. And then because the people who are really good learn from breaking something, right? Right. And, but we're like, oh, I just spent $20 on this part. Is it going to work? Am I going to break it? And you just have to jump in because then you can, then you learn. So I, I'm sort of like you, and so I'm like, oh, I don't want to wreck it, or if I do, <laughs> and sometimes I do, and other times it works, and I feel really proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know; it's sort of a mixed bag. <laughs> so I feel that more and more people are getting interested in not just microbiology in general, but outer space. I mean, especially with the images that are coming out, I feel like it is inspiring people to move towards a more science direction, at least if not for their own personal knowledge, but, you know, for a career choice. So what advice would you give someone who's interested in going into the field of like astrobiology? Yeah, I guess um, be curious. <laughs> That's the big thing. You want to be curious, right? And you have to like being uncomfortable in how much you know, because because astrobiology is so interdisciplinary, now, I might not feel comfortable when I talk to astrophysicists, for example, but you just keep trying. Or when I talk to organic synthesis, you know, we have to figure out our common language first or our common objectives. And that's, you know, so that's, but, but also don't worry about not being an expert because sometimes just the creativity and innovation comes from people who are not experts. Right? So, so I think, um, you know, just have a broad, broad background in, uh, in, in science. Um, or, or or in technology, I think there's a lot that can be done now with uh, in uh, essentially the statistics or uh, 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 software use of software. Mm -hmm. So you know, it depends on what you, what your jam is, right? Um, I've taken, uh, I guess I like to think of myself as a lifelong learner. So I've been really lucky to have uh, colleagues who let me come in their lab and spend a week bumbling around to you know grow cultures do extractions, you know, and not to be able to be even good at it, but be able to talk with them and understand what they do. <laughs> or likewise, sampling with them in the field, right? Or I've taken a bunch of programming courses, mostly in Python. I'm never going to be a fast coder, but at least I understand more about the logic. And it's the same with, same with bioinformatics. I, you know, I've worked with colleagues and I first you know, I did blast analyses and then I read review papers just to be able to talk with them. And it's that finding that intersection between you know, say in my case, geochemistry and microbiology, which is really interesting because you see how there's such inter interdependent uh, disciplines, I guess, and how that intersection can be really interesting. So I, I guess, yeah, just find something that interests you. And if it doesn't interest you, then change. <laughs> and <laughs> actually, what, that's one thing I like about, ge I liked about geology initially was that it was one major where in college where it required chemistry, biology, physics, and geology. And so require all those things, right? Where you could go and be a chemist and learn some chemistry. Mm -hmm. I liked I liked that multiple spinner approach from our age. It is a little bit uncomfortable though. <laughs> <laughs> you you bring up a good point uh, that the multidisciplinary aspect of it because my wife and I were talking a couple months back and you know like maybe fifty to a hundred years ago certain fields were very like uh narrow like microbiology maybe just microbiology but now you have biochemistry being involved physics is getting involved yeah. engineering bioinformatics like python and r those coding systems are starting to be used everywhere now before i started out i started out taking r to to, to be able to you know work with some of the data for bioinformatics and now now python is has intruded <laughs> so i can, <laughs> can use python instead but yeah that's exactly right and it, um sorry go ahead and finish your question before us you know the the further we get into understanding the more fields need to get involved or are developed to try to answer the questions we're asking yeah that's a really good point and i also think about you know just discipline so for example when i was an undergrad i majored in geology just this year 
the geology department at Stanford has gone away. Now it's some kind of sustainability discipline. So I think we, we're moving in school and universities, we're moving away from the single discipline focus to interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary to, to think about problems or processes, right? And I think astrobiology is really well suited to that. And or anything, right? You might, um, you know, we were talking before you started recording about the human biome, right? So there, there is a lot of interest just from an academic standpoint of who's living on us and what are they doing? And what is the symbiosis and why is that interesting? It also relates to medicine and how, you know, maybe our microbiome influences our mood, influences our what foods we want. <laughs> you know, as we, as we, you know, as, as our medicine becomes more personalized, maybe that will become an area, right? Okay. Right. And someone will take a swab of your skin and rather than your DNA and say, your system is telling us that you're deficient in this. <laughs> like that. Or, you know, you need to borrow some, uh, Actually, this is funny because um, uh, <laughs> it's kind of primitive, but one of my, I, I have a horse and he's in a small, small uh, ranch with seven horses. And one of those horses has the most, apparently, apparently the most consistent poop. And uh, uh, he's owned by a vet. <laughs> and she actually sends some of her clients to come and collect his poop and mix it with their horse's food. To introduce that the consistent horse, <laughs> and to, you know, to change the gut biome of these other horses, just to get to mix the communities. <laughs> so um, the hope is that their horses will become more, more regular as well, and apparently it works. So I'm surprised the horses eat it, but they do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, that's a bit of a tangent. <laughs> when you're interested in microbiology, you find it everywhere. <laughs> oh yeah, it's just a Different way for fecal microbiome transplant. Yeah. Okay, yeah. See? So you have better language than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you see the field in the next five years? Um, the field of microbiology? Astrobiology, Astro sorry. Um, I, I think, gosh, well, five years, wouldn't it be we found some kind of evidence in microbial life? I think, uh, or, or I know now with the James Webb, we'll be better able to actually determine atmospheres of exoplanets. So there are people who study, you know, what does it take if, if you're observing an atmosphere of the planet, what what is an indication of life? Right? How can you tell there might be life there? Or is it all, you know, are these nitrogen gases produced by volcanoes or something else? Right? So we're right. still trying to figure this out, right? What what is a biomarker, a bioindicator? Or a biosignature of life. So I think we'll we find we find that to a great degree, and I think the number of, of candidate exoplanets for life detection um, will go up dramatically. I'm hoping we'll have more missions to uh, the planets and moons with life detection capabilities. Um, but I also think that our instrumentation will be developing, right? So I think the autonomy and the machines, both for um, you know, terrestrial applications, we'll be able to go in the field and in the field, say, boom, here's an assay. And, you know, with our computing power, know what we're seeing. Oh, this, you know, the dominant species here is sulfur reducing or something like that, right? So that'll be really, that'll be really remarkable. Um, anyway, a lot, I can go on. <laughs> I guess I'm speculating here, like robots that can do that. That's one of the downsides right now, right? Because any robot that goes to, say, Mars, they have to wait for a signal to 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 react, right? Actually, that's been changing, right? Oh, really? It's been interesting. And so I mentioned I worked on the Curiosity rover team for 10 years. Um, and what what happens is the, the nominal mission was one Martian year, which is about two Earth years. And then you have to the team has to has to propose, can we keep going? Well, will NASA support us to keep going? And they usually do. I mean, if you if you're making good progress and um, uh, you know, showing good results, but they don't give you the same funding. So little by little, the number of people involved in the project has been dwindling. And but we want to do great science still. So what's happened is um, people have developed um, autonomy capabilities for these rovers. So they first introduced it in exploration rovers for an opportunity, and they have you know, expanded that software for the Mars Curiosity rovers. So the rover might pick. Okay, here I am going forward, and I see these different rocks. 
which one looks most interesting based on something, color, our inventory, what's different, what's the same. And then it'll go, cycle through opportunistic science. Usually in the case of you know, Ken Can or Razor, or if it doesn't have to move, it doesn't have to move to and drop the arm. So it, and, and that way, the amount of human planning for activities is, is less, right? Because we're just letting them do some automatic data collection. I didn't realize that was already out. Yeah. So it is, yeah, it's a, it's a uh, called Aegis software. I can't, A-E-G-I-S, I can't remember what it stands for, but it's um, developed at JPL and they use that to um, essentially extend the activities um, or just, you know, take, take, take people out of the loop. <laughs> it's a better bang for the taxpayer's dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good because the mission can keep going and right. you know, keep going and keep discovering it. And, uh, the, the current curiosity and, and, and perseverance, they both have um, radioactive power sources so they can go on until other parts decay, whereas Spirit an opportunity to have solar power supplies. So they have to, you know, when the winter comes, they, they're further away from the sun and they would, uh, didn't have as much battery left to operate. So they kind of hope to or do less. And then, you know, sometimes the, the dust would settle on the panels, in which case the battery was less optimal. Charging, so so I you know ideally the radioactive power supply is is the way to go. It's just there; it's a lot more challenging to get access to that. So, I guess as a side note, like how long is that battery supposed to last for? Um, lifetimes, or human lifetimes. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a plutonium source. Okay. Uh, it'll go for a long time, and uh, I don't know if you you saw this, but Curiosity had. Early in the mission, the wheels are kind of brittle, and the, and there's some worry that the wheels are going to break. And um, or you know, I think Spirit, you know, one of the legs sort of died, and then it was dragging the leg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, it, it dragged on the ground, and that's where it revealed ice. It was like, oh, it, it uncovered ice under the you know the surface regular. It's like, oh, that poor little broken robot, but how cool! <laughs> <laughs> so you know, um, anyway, um, yeah, there's. <laughs> It's amazing to think that we, you know, we actually have uh, two robots active on Mars, plus plus China, so three robots active on Mars. I think the Chinese mission is has ended now, but they may still be going. I'm not sure, actually. I was just it's just funny to hear like a, a an accident leading to a big discovery. <laughs> <laughs> I know way, way to frame it up, right? <laughs> right. But I think I think we could look look in. Uh, Sort of science and technology, a lot of um, discoveries are serendipitous, and the rest of the time we're just plugging away. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so before we go, is there anyone that you are thankful for that you like to shout out? Um, yeah, I have to say um, I'm married to a pretty awesome man, and uh, like you, I married a scientist, or you know, he's a he's a geologist, and he studies hydrothermal energy or geothermal energy. Actually, so he does. I like to say he's the more practical one in the family. <laughs> so he you know, looks at uh, you know, power plants and how much energy they generate uh, geologic resources and how they can provide neighborhoods and communities and countries with energy uh, as a renewable energy resource. Um, and um, especially during the pandemic, I mean, all along he's been really supportive, but especially during the pandemic, I enlisted him to come out in the field with me. So he became my field assistant when we couldn't have very many people with us. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he's... Um, uh, really, he may not be experienced in astrobiology, but he's you know he knows volcanoes and he knows um, field work, and so it's been really great, great to have him. <laughs> and I guess uh, just many many colleagues, right? Um, this business has ups and downs. Um, a lot of the work I do requires writing proposals to get research funded and getting rejected. <laughs> and just when I think, oh, uh, should I stop? Then get, you know having a big project funded, so that's fun. Um, I would just say that the, the team members I work with um, make make the work all well worthwhile. So that's great. Thank you for coming on the show, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Well, Microbial Nation, that is our episode. I would like to thank Dr. John Blanc again for coming on, and hope you all really enjoyed our interview with her. In our next episode, we will be covering some science fiction and how it relates to astral microbiology and how it relates to real life. 
If you have any suggestions as to what we should cover, don't hesitate to let us know. We'd love to hear from you. You could mail us at microbegales at gmail.com or hit us up on, on Twitter at microbegales. Don't forget, we also have a blog at microbegales.com where you can check out what we have been writing and also where you can find more of our podcasts. And remember, everyone, it may not be aliens that we find on other planets. It might be microbes. Until next time, everybody, bye.